Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, you can give back if you love this program and others like it at aksum.substack.com, directly on YouTube, as well as patreon.com slash aksum. Today's special guest is Paul Gene Nichols. Welcome to the program. Uh, thanks for having me. My pleasure. Um, there are a million places that we um, could start, and um, maybe we'll eventually get to the fact that we met IRL from X, which I always appreciate. But I'm I'm fascinated. I think mostly. I mean, you and I, I think, vibed on a few different topics, but religion being the foremost one and one of my specialties, I'd love to discuss with you. If you knew anything or could say anything about the the religious background of your parents and or grandparents, um, I can talk. I can talk about my parents, and and to a lesser degree about um, my grandparents. I don't know. Did you, you know, not to be too meta or whatever? Did you catch those two videos I sent you? I caught most of one of them, but I didn't. Um... I didn't finish it, um, so that, I, I wouldn't want you to repeat exactly. But I'm sure we'll go in a different direction. So, like, um, I'll just I'll just go into a bit of family history, um, and I'll, I'll pull the the religious stuff out of that. Um, my my mom and my dad met in Germany in the early '80s. They were both in the army. I don't I don't know the the US army, right? Not the yeah, German. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> not, not the German army. Um just checking. <laughs> and so I, I my dad was involved in some sort of Russian translating thing in Germany at the end of um the Cold War. And that's that's where my interest uh in, in Russia comes from is is growing up in this what being born and growing up in this late cold war yes situation there was the I, I can't remember what the movie was called i think it was called the day after um it was a tv movie on like abc or something where nuclear war happens and you see what happens to everybody in the states after that and there were some famous people uh from the 80s in that and so that 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 fear of like total nuclear annihilation and an ever present danger was definitely something that was in the uh, air when I was growing up and something that I think my dad felt acutely. Um, the neither my parents are particularly religious. My dad raised me atheist. Um, like intentionally. So like, or just very intentional, quote unquote neutral very intentionally not not yeah. true at all so his he grew up in a northern baptist church he grew up in a wealthy suburb of boston his dad was an electrical engineer at ibm and that's why he pushed me towards studying electrical engineering in college i have a degree from ut austin and electrical engineering technically was mostly computer engineering and software development my training is in real-time digital signal processing computer architecture and um, system software system software being stuff like mac os operating system type stuff so that's that's what i'm recording on right now <laughs> that's my educational background and he grew up and i mean he's he's a very intellectual person very interested in ideas and he read the bible when he was young and dismissed religion and when he came around to raising me and my five younger siblings he said christianity is bad religion is bad it's just wrong it's going to lead people down the wrong path and out of that came things like christmas is not good but winter mm. present time is good so well open presence on winter solstice yeah. that that was his um approach mom 
my mom calls herself a Christian, but I don't think she's ever really attended church much. My dad's mom. S same tradition or different? And I, I do want to linger a bit because I know a little bit about the history of Boston. I've only ever been there once passing through on the way to Dartmouth uh, in New Hampshire, but I didn't know Baptists was big there. In fact, all the people I know from Boston are Irish and Italian, and they seem to all be Catholic. And then I know the Protestants from there are typically like the uh, the Congregationalists. And then of course the, the Ivy Leagues, um, which kind of abandoned open religion, had a, a faith that I think sort of molded mostly into the Unitarian Universalist church, which I've, I've met at least one former coworker of mine from Boston who went to Harvard. He, he had that faith. You're the first Baptist of Boston that I've ever met. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't I'm, call myself. Not, uh, not saying you are, yeah. but has any connection to that tradition. I, I think of it mostly as a Southern tradition, which you, it's cool that you're, you're in um, New England and in, uh, the South there. Well, I, I mean, I don't, I'm pretty ignorant about Protestantism. I mean, I've, I've, I've learned more since becoming Orthodox. Um, but I don't, I don't really know. I don't really know how my mom would pin down. Um, but she was neither Orthodox nor Catholic. She would have been some type of Protestant in your imagination. Well, I don't, I mean that that's that that's gets, even too much really i i think you know in the in the muslim world uh i i think you're not able to escape in in your own mind i would imagine the fact that you're muslim even if uh you drink wine and fornicate yeah um, and I think, you know, like Tom, Tom Holland with Dominion has made, a, and, and also Jordan Peterson talking about the Christian roots of the West has, has made the point that, you know, just as the nominal Muslim in the Islamic world is, is a Muslim still, even if he's not practicing, where all Christians in the West, we just don't know it. What we've done is we've abstracted away from christianity things like so-called human rights mm -hmm. and have tried to make those well we've made the claim that the universal and ultimately that's backed by american hegemony but it's not H human rights without god aren't aren't really a thing it's a christian concept and we're just not able to admit that so i think my mom has a, a sense of nominal christianity but th that th that doesn't anchor itself in any tradition not that not that i feel comfortable with the idea of protestants claiming that they have any sort of tradition i don't you know not to you know shots fired or whatever but i i have a hard time when protestants talk about their tradition tradition primarily because it's hard to be traditional in any sense when what lies below your beliefs is rebellion and defining yourself by what you're not that's that's to me strikes me as fundamentally anti-traditional yeah i think it's anti-capital t traditional but there is um, a sense in which escaping tradition is impossible and so i think it's like a, a matter of the rate of change and so rebellion as the ultimate or most rapid form of change means that their tradition is changing far quicker than the historic churches would. But it's interesting you you um, you positioned it in terms of Islam, which is true, but it's also true of the of Christianity of the Near East. I can't speak of other places, but certainly like the Levant, the Middle East, and the Horn of Africa. Um, thinking of two countries specifically, Lebanon and Ethiopia, it's it's very much the case where you may have even had certain individuals who uh, could be described kind of as de facto atheists, but de jure or de jure, it, they're like, they are within a tradition. Um, and especially I think Lebanon formalized it where there's like a certain amount of positions in their parliamentary system 
that have to go quota wise to Orthodox, to Greek Orthodox Christians, to Eastern Catholics, to Sunni Muslims, to Shia Muslims, like to that degree of uh, tradition. But okay, so so that's fair about the kind of religious background of them. So then um, at some point, a, a few of the conversations you and I have had have revolved around China. I want to give you a hat tip, by the way, because I got uh, a job I'm on contract now for next year. I'll be teaching world history, and you pointed me towards a, a book I'll ask you about in a little bit. But I'm I'm wondering then in this landscape of maybe uh, materialism, and you pointed at your science background, so maybe guided by this kind of view of capital S science or scientism. How did you ever get interested in things of the Far East, things of China? Oh, I mean that's. I mean that that makes me into a, a a basic modern Western man in a sense. You know the people pick up meditation and uh, aspects of Buddhism because I think it, it's the same thing as the whole Enlightenment human rights stuff. We we try and claim that these this found foundational metaphysics is not Christian and that sets us up in a place where we can't we can't grab that as as our spiritual tradition because on a fundamental level we've rejected it and so I think a lot of Westerners look towards these Eastern beliefs as the only place they can go like the Beatles with India and all that jazz and so, I mean, I was casually interested in Japanese culture because of anime and, and video okay. games. And many such cases. Many such, <laughs> many such cases. And that, that gradually led me towards China. And Interesting. in 2006, I read The Art of War. And that... Sun Tzu, right? Yeah, Sansa, and that 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 transformed me, and that that's that's how I found my proclivity towards religiosity. You could say in two thousand six. So let me pause you there because that's a a good point. I I've heard that described as a political, military, perhaps a philosophical work, and I think there's this funny thing that certain western scholars do when they look at the religiosity of china and they'll say actually there's no religion there to speak of it's almost like defining the word religion away maybe they'll use the word like spirituality or something else but sometimes they'll say like this is the issue of trying to spread the gospel in places like that is that there's no even conception of uh, loyalty to one deity rather an incorporation and assimilation of different pantheons so is is the art of war a religious text the art the art of war is very much a religious text tell me more please <laughs> i've never read it um where to start so uh i'm a, i'm a very ambitious person by nature i'm status and power seeking and what attracted me to the art of war was probably is it is it the is gordon gecko the name of the character from wall street um it, it might by, be, yeah, the, the film. and i i just vaguely recall and i i don't think i've ever watched the whole movie but there's this scene where charlie sheen and michael douglas are talking and michael douglas is some sort of um wall street shark and he talks about the art of war and somehow that stuck in me. And when I approach the text, it it has that. Uh, you can you can see techniques for ruling people in it and for winning battle, but its spirit undermines that. It, Interesting. It, it speaks a lot about. I mean, for example, if you're running a war a long distance away from your nation, Sunset talks about this, the cost of running supplies to your army is, it's more than 
simply proportional to the dis the physical distance from where your people are and you're going to bankrupt yourself trying to feed and clothe and preserve that army at a distance and so he's he he builds in all this talk about the cost and how you're going to bankrupt your nation and things like if you don't know yourself and you don't know your enemy there's no hope of you ever winning and so the the when the mind is ready it, it will see the the folly of war in that text and that's that's how it gets in that's how it's a Taoist text it 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 it'll show you like the the truth underneath those actions and so that got me into to Taoism and I proceeded to study a number of Taoist texts very closely after that I I studied the eastern religions just a little bit in high school and minimally on my own and of course it's in the the middle school curriculum um which I've kind of been through but I need to go through their major texts more to get a better take and I found it uh <laughs> I found a lot of people find it difficult to kind of summarize it in a succinct way maybe and maybe that's part of it but i understand and i do want to get to buddhism after but the way i understand buddhism as a reaction to hinduism i i have seen from what i've read that taoism is a sort of reaction to uh, confucianism i want to get your thoughts on if that is the case or if it's a totally separate thing because um what i've come to understand is it it seems to emphasize more subjective truth but the way you presented it it sounds almost like it is a, a plain objective truth to people who encounter that i mean it's kind of in nature or something i don't i don't see uh confucianism and taoism in opposition and taoism precedes confucianism so okay uh, yeah so like So yeah, that, that that's new to me. That's new to me because I thought Confucianism, and it may have just been a particular period in Chinese history that I was looking at, but I thought that one was the one that had greater emphasis on tradition and deference to elders, which could kind of match some of the commands that you see in in the Old Testament. But then you know it also might include ancestor worship, which which would not be uh, included. Something that people might see, for example, when they see the movie Mulan um but i thought taoism was more individualistic is that a is that a caricature i the, the, this stuff is is not easy to to tease out i think for a lot of people um for a number of reasons da taoism taoism has practices and and rituals and i've i've long said taoism is it, it Taoism is for sages. So in a, in a sense, it is individualistic, but I think the, the patterns in Taoism are the, the same as those in Christianity. And I think I, I, I'm not studied up on the stuff enough, but my intuition is that a case could be made that Confucianism particularizes things when it comes to order societal order familial relations and that that's der derivable from taoism um there's a lot of stuff in taoism that are you might call degenerate practices um <laughs> at, at least yeah. from, from certain perspectives D taoism has a um a version of the of tantra let's say and Taoism, Taoism has tried to explore all sorts of things about human experience and and the human condition, but follow, following certain paths in that is is not necessarily healthy. <laughs> yeah, it might be way off, but there's the Marco Polo famous Netflix series, which I really appreciated. Um, supposed to be loosely based on his writings in the court of Kublai Khan the Mongol, of course, a descendant of Genghis Khan. 
and there's a enslaved character who after uh, a raid on a Taoist monastery uh, serves the Khan. And one of the kind of ongoing jokes that he has is that he's not like other monks. And he he expresses that by, like, he still has self-control, so he's not like a total drunkard, but like he's very enthusiastic about the consumption of alcohol. And he doesn't see that as an issue with his view of religiosity. Like, he's not agnostic about that. I mean, in, in the Orthodox tradition, we like to say that um, everything is create in creation is good. Um, Amen. Alcohol, sex, it's all good. It's it's more about the hierarchy in which these things are structured within your life that determines whether or not they are harmful or beneficial. That's right. Um, so another major text that you introduced me to, which is the one I inferred earlier is alternatively called something like journey to the west or the monkey king i've actually been looking at two major translations there's one from penguin random house and there's another one i think his uh, name is anthony Yu, who's an actual uh, chinese man who's lived in the west um and I've, I've just begun to to look at these two translations of it but you you read the unabridged <laughs> version could you talk again about your your desire to uh, you know like Talk about the sheer length of that text, and uh, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, that's where Buddhism comes into play as well with within part of that. And um, was it Neil Gaiman, the famous writer, said something to the effect that it's a mythos or story that's in the soul of 1.5 billion people. This this story, which is also behind Dragon Ball and League of Legends and arguably One Piece and stuff like that. Well, and and Naruto and Naruto, yeah. The, um... But Naruto also has Japanese myth behind it. Of course, uh, Jiraiya is that that character in, in Naruto. Um, he he's featured in a a classic mythological story in Japan, and Tsunade and Orochimaru are also in the story, and so that that aspect of Naruto is borrowed from uh, Japanese culture, but aspects of naruto like the um shadow clone jutsu uh uh sun wukong engages in a uh shadow clone type thing he he pulls off some of his hair chews it spits it out and creates a bunch of clones of himself so that they're very clear clear aspects of that story that have been pulled into into naruto but the the journey to the west it's it's a story that was compiled by an author in, I think, the 16th century. And, but it, it tells a story from the Tang dynasty, which is, has true root. Uh, it has true roots in history. But what happened is that, that to story got retold over and over again through oral storytelling. Mm -hmm. And, all of these oral storytelling traditions were compiled into this hundred chapter, two thousand page work. And part of that story is the origin of Sun Wukong and Wiki King. Part of that is the origin of the Tang Dynasty monk who was given the task of going to the West India to bring back uh, the sutras, the the Buddhist scriptures, and. So there's the origin story of the monkey, then there's the origin story of the monk, and then there's this series of largely unrelated stories where they're journeying to the West, and then they finally get the scriptures and they, they return at the end. And here the West is, it's South Asia, right? The Indian subcontinent, not yeah. America? N not America. Not Europe? <laughs> not Europe. <laughs> and so... I like that. There's a real story there, and and because of the oral storytelling and the breadth of this they they tie together all these elements buddhism in china taoism um chinese heaven with the jade emperor ruling over that that's all pulled together and so you can in that story you can see how how chinese culture has come to see how all these elements 
are related. Yeah, it it is very interesting how it how it integrates it. And earlier you were talking about how Taoism wasn't necessarily incompatible with or mutually exclusive with certain other things. I've seen people write, for example, the the Tao of Winnie the Pooh, I think is famous. There's I think a Protestant writer who had the Tao of Christ and the Orthodox people, I think, who are connected to the Death to the World magazine had the uh, Christ, the Eternal Tao, or Tao. I, I know there's a TD thing going on there. Uh, <laughs> wonders of transliteration for the language nerds. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm imagining then, because I'm hearing you discuss patterns, and you mentioned Peterson earlier, how did you first stumble upon... Um, Jordan Peterson and his contribution to your journey is fascinating to me because like at the time of this recording as far as I know he still hasn't taken that full leap and he's kind of been in in the middle between systems of metaphysics and I've I've actually had a couple friends who are like that where because they're so open minded they explore all these different thoughts, point of views, world views, things like that and they're even able to convince of others of it almost like they're guinea pigs, but they themselves don't take that leap because they they want to be in in the middle. So how, how did Jordan Peterson come on your radar? Was it the Canadian pronoun stuff or something else? I mean, it, it, it happened around the Canadian pronoun stuff time. Uh, would have been mid-2016. Um, at that point, it'd been about a decade that Taoism had been working on me and helping to undermine my my materialist position. And uh, in 2012, I I went through a, a rough time where I, I was with a girlfriend for ten years, and and that ended in a very messy way. And I had to rebuild my life and get back into writing software um which looking back i it maybe that was a mistake in some sense taking that too far because now i'm i make a lot of money i'm i'm pretty successful in that again because i'm good at it but i feel i feel somewhat trapped because i'm dependent on <laughs> on that income and, and putting up with the whole corporate world um but i was i was i was ripe to to reevaluate a lot of things and that's when i hit in 2012 the um the book the righteous mind by jonathan Haidt. oh yeah okay and I'd, I'd already been in the process of deconstructing my nominal liberalism in in 2008 the financial crisis happened and I got into studying finance and economics as a hobby. And that got me towards the so-called Austrian economists. And then wow. similar. Uh, <laughs> and that, that opened me up to the idea that maybe, maybe wealth and money and, and that sort of thing. It wasn't just a matter of some people hoarding it and, preventing the poor from having a good life it, there there were more complications to that and then jonathan Haidt undermined the social liberalism that i had because i began to understand that it's not it's not a matter of lacking empathy or education that makes people let's say conservative for lack of a better term that, that people are temperamentally predisposed to approaching the world in a certain way and that it's actually the, this distribution of different temperaments that allows us to navigate the world. You know, that they, they're, he, for example, he talks about how morality has a foundation in our disgust response. And so the same, this sense of needing to be clean and needing to have borders, that, that that's a fundamental aspect of certain human temperaments, and that's not something that's going to go away. Then there are other people who are more open to ideas. They're more open to 
looser borders. They're more more open to new experiences, mm -hmm. and that it it's a a conversation between these temperaments that navigates the community over time. And these temperaments are static, or are they susceptible to change? Because I've heard these arguments before. I haven't read his text, and I. I always wonder if it was like me in different times um, in like big five personality traits, which Peterson has tests of like on his website. I I once scored a hundred percent on open mindedness and a, a sister of mine was like, I don't know if that's a good thing. Um, at the same time, um, you know, my dad, put, along with Austrian economics, although it's a different thing, uh, is usually uh correlated to libertarianism whether lowercase l or capital l and my dad would always be like how are you both that thing and the super into orthodoxy these things are in intention and that is something that's worked on me over the past few years which made me question my own what is my temperament uh, so do you, do you view these things as static or are they susceptible to change um well P peterson has said that a sufficient dose of psilocybin <laughs> can have a long-term effect on increasing the openness in a person. I've so heard I, th that. I think that there, there's an extent to which it can change. I think it's it's both that's more, exogenous change right there. <laughs> it's more it's more static than a lot of people would like to believe, but. I think something that Haidt talks about in the book is you you have this temperament and that affects how you interact with the world and that that shapes you. And so they 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 humans are plastic to some extent. But we have we have an underlying temperament and structure which is um built in. And Agreed. We interact with the environment in a particular way that's particular to our nature, and that that shapes us. I saw him live sometime in 2018, I think, or 2019, and he likened us to uh, a chess game. He says, "You don't have unlimited plasticity. You don't have unlimited moves, um, but you also don't have just ten moves. There are like thousands, if not millions, of moves available to you." And I, as a chess guy, that that stuck out to me. Let's, I mean, I think part, how do I put this? Part, part of the problem with orthodoxy, you know, it's, it's great that it, it, we've managed to preserve Christianity over 2,000 years, but r the real orthodox Christianity has been embattled the entire time. There was Islam, there was communism. There's the breaking away of, of the West and the Protestant Reformation. And so I think what that's done to us is it's it that fuels maybe conservatism and trying to stick to things. And I see that today in things like the the debates over yoga. Uh, <laughs> yes christians shouldn't do yoga and i i i don't i don't buy this yeah it's, you know like if you're doing yoga and you're actively worshiping hindu gods while you're doing it that's probably not a good thing as a christian but <laughs> going back to everything that god has created is good if it's placed properly within the hierarchy if you're going to tell me that God didn't make us to perform those moves and that those are things that God didn't create, I'm going to have a hard time taking you seriously as a human being. <laughs> Big fan of the show. I'm sure he's watching whenever this is posted. And I had a mini debate about this very issue. I agree with you 100%. It's functional. A lot of studios in Los Angeles will literally um, have you do, I don't know if it's called a tantric breathing but like the breathing exercises in a guided way alongside the burning of incense before literal idols in in that scenario i would say yeah orthodox christian don't do that 
my introduction to yoga was in 2010 from Tony Horton, who I believe is a secular uh, Jew who's a personal trainer to the stars in Hollywood. And he is associated with Beachbody.com and had a totally secular thing called Yoga X, which was a part of P90X, which is one of the power yogas. The next kind of evolution of yoga that I saw was from a arguably, you know, Hindu or atheist, like kind of a dodgy guy, Sadhguru, who's made himself famous. And he himself points back to the historic Hatha yoga. And if you're sticking, I think, to the 80 or so uh, asanas or like the stretching poses, it's different than, <laughs> to your point, the formal worship of the gods. So, so I think, I think, I think we've come to a point where orthodoxy is resistant to people with more openness. Um, and I mean, for good reason, this goes back to the purity disgust stuff is just as when you eat something, you're allowing something to cross your borders. Mm. When you when you engage in new ideas, you're allowing something to cross your borders. And the problem with that is something you can be poison. Um, ideas you take up can also be poison. And so any sort of embattled culture is going to continue to be more and more resistant to outside ideas and outside ideas and external influence because there is a there's a natural fear of things which have the potential to disintegrate your body if you try to integrate them i do like that and so for you personally on that temperament scale then are you also i'm like high in openness you are okay that's fascinating yeah okay so i i thought so but that also part of it surprised me but it, it makes sense when i think about it and so um what do you taking it back to what i was asking earlier what do you make of the fact that it's really impressive that your father had this translation history with the russian language jordan peterson has this uh, focus and emphasis especially on the russian literature of the modern period which by which time Russia has been thoroughly almost indistinguishable in, in almost indistinguishable in its culture from orthodox christianity as its religion and he really likes and appreciates it but kind of still keeps himself at a distance but but he's had some impact on you where you're like all right <laughs> i need to hop on board this is the winning team what what do you make of that disconnect between like you pulling the trigger there but him not well, I mean, th there's some steps involved. You know, there, there's the there, there's the Taoism stuff, which spoke to my built-in religiosity, and it opened me up to to the spiritual. Then there was the economics and the uh, psychology of morality, which showed me material reasons why the claims of progressives were inaccurate let's say and then there was peterson who tied all of this stuff together and convinced me that i am christian and that i need to take that aspect of myself seriously and then i i was like okay i guess i should try to go to church and so in 2017 early 2017 i was working at a telehealth startup and i became friends with um a south african who had left for australia and got married had five kids and ended up in the states working with somebody he went to high school with back in south africa there i don't want to go into the south africa thing too much but um, there's been a massive South African diaspora. And uh, because I'm, I'm the oldest of six kids, that is probably one reason why I, I liked this guy, because was, he was living this life 
that I should have grown up with mm -hmm. if my parents had it together and they had a community and they wanted to raise their kids right instead of us being isolated and more interested in screens and video games and and things like that and so he was going to a church plant of an australian church not hillsong but <laughs> a, a less successful one at <sighs> melbourne called planet shakers and so i was like okay and so i just started going and it's like kill song they they write their own songs they're big in the philippines you know that's that sort of thing it's the rock band i i fog machine cool pastor in the ripped jeans sort of thing i refer to it as rock band fog machine church and so i i i just took it seriously and I, I went in the first 30 minutes of those sorts of, I, I, I feel uncomfortable with labeling that as worship. That's what they call it. But the, the first 30 minutes is the band is going. The first 15 minutes are like a series of really exciting songs. You're jumping up and down. They're getting your energy up. And then they transition into these sad songs, you know, where, oh, God, I don't deserve you, blah, 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 blah. And then the the pastor walks in while they're playing chords on the piano and they've stopped singing. And this whole stage managed thing, and I took it absolutely 100% seriously because I figured I got to do it and see what happens. And it became this whole thing for a couple of years where I ended up leaving the telehealth startup and working at the church app startup that the pastor ran. And so no way. So I was upstairs at the church building during the week working. I was going to classes at night. I was doing photography at the services on Sunday. And it got to the point where it was, I wasn't feeling it anymore. And after how long? I don't know, a year or so. And the, the work situation wasn't great. That was part of it. I felt I was there six or seven days a week. And so the first thing I did was I pulled back on the photography. And then I realized pretty quickly, now that I wasn't actively doing something that interested me during the services, it wasn't stirring me. And I had already encountered Pajot at that point. OK. And on online, he, yeah, watching his videos because I was watching everything Peterson put out, and then when Peugeot started doing his videos, I was watching everything he put out. And um, I'm I'm still comfortable with evolution. I still think it it it's a useful model, and these charismatics weren't into that, and I was just realizing that this isn't this isn't a place for me, and I tweeted something at Peugeot and he responded <laughs> and beautiful and something about I forget the exact interaction at this point but something about that um got me to thinking well you know I can't le leaving the church is going to be complicated because I work for the pastor yeah but I can't really give up on Christianity but I can't do this anymore and Peugeot seems to be Orthodoxy seems to be working for him. So I searched for Orthodox churches and I found St. Elias in Austin. And my father's namesake. <laughs> I went to uh, a Vespers on a Saturday. And then because, wow. because we were downtown at this hundred year old church built by um, Arabs who had come to the States. And we were growing so there were two services which you need special dispensation from a bishop to have two liturgies at a church uh, on the same day and so we would have the 8 30 service and then we'd have the 10 30 service downtown since then we've built a uh, a new campus up north and so now there's two campuses but so i would i would go to the 8 30 
liturgy and then I would run over to uh, the other church, which wasn't that far away, just to hide the fact that my loyalties were changing. But eventually I, I broke off from the church and I stayed at the app company a little longer. But while while that was happening, this was the October of, of 2018, right before the Pascha where I was baptized in April 2019, the the Australians came and they kicked the American pastor out. Wow. And so or heresy or for what? By the way, I think you broke one of the biggies uh, Ten Crack Commandments. <laughs> but it's it I mean they didn't they didn't feel like he was towing the line sufficiently. Yeah. And that's that's how we ended up in WeWork. And I was there until August 2019. Oh um, and he, he, he built his own, own church called Dreamers Church in Austin and doing the same thing. And yeah. the, the guy is, is a, he used to be a used car salesman. I mean, the, the stuff, you can't write this. You know, you couldn't write, write any of this. It's just, it's straight out of the um, stereotypes. Oh my god, yeah, there's a Hillsong documentary and a WeWork documentary. So I just <laughs> the so, parallels are crazy. So I I just I had I had to take Christianity seriously, so I had to become Orthodox and I just I just dove into it. Yeah, the even the parallels you have with not just these famous documentaries, but within my own life on a number of things things is really funny. I'm cradle, but I feel like a convert sometimes because my parents never compelled me to go to church. They took me once a month and um, not, not even they took me, but I got set up like they took me to my aunties who then took me once a month. My parents actually probably took me just to um, Epiphany or Theophany and Christmas and Easter. And they themselves, I think, didn't grow up going to church regularly. But so I'm cradle, but I feel like a convert because it was in my early 20s that I came back. Mm -hmm. And one of the reticences that I had was okay, is everybody a young earth creationist? If so, maybe I could kind of passively be here, but certainly not be in any teaching roles because there would be some, <laughs> some gaps. <laughs> and even now, I see it kind of being a mix of things and so it's interesting that you mention that because i think there definitely are um for me evolution is not an issue of dogma and i appreciate that but i think there are those who would wish that it was dogmatic in either direction which is why i always go back to galatians which teaches people of different backgrounds to be able to sit in table fellowship together and and break bread making it a table of the Lord and not a table of demons. I'm so glad you you found something in Pajo and, and took that leap to an Elias parish, no less. <laughs> well, I think, uh, a very famous uh, saint, by the way, in, in the Near East and the Horn of Africa. I mean, I think, I mean, I think the, 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 the problem here is, is that we've all become materialists. And fundamentalism is an attempt to make something which is not propositional propositional. So the the Orthodox faith is not about I mean, in some sense it is about what you believe, but it's not in the not in the way I think a lot of Protestants and post Enlightenment people think. Yeah, it's it's only about a select few those dogmas. Well, it's like the the creed. Like I, these Protestants come up with all these confessions and all these creeds, and they're they're trying to to make you know you've got to believe this list of things in order to be saved, whatever that means. But the the Nicene Creed is is guardrails. It's not. In some sense, it's a statement of faith, but it's more like guardrails that exist to prevent you from falling into heresy. 
And the, one of the mistakes of the Protestants is to see things propositionally and not, um, not as embodiment. Liturgy is not about, oh, I believe this list of things. It's about forming the proper body uh, and focusing your attention in the proper place. And so it's, it's more about being. Yeah, it's reorienting your life. I'm wondering in your conversion, um, some people caricature our various branches or jurisdictions of orthodoxy as ethnic enclaves. And you mentioned that it was a uh, Arabs early on. I don't know if they were Palestinian or Syrian or Lebanese, but um, I, I, I'm assuming it is the Greek church of there and not the Syriac one that's in communion with yeah, I mean, it's, mine. It, it's Antioch um mm -hmm. originally which was greek territory mm -hmm. um now it's in turkey but that's 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 the the branch um that i i joined so were there without having to disparage but just keeping it honest and keeping it real for anyone considering the path that you're you're going was it easy as a man of your ethnic background to just blend in because I know that tradition actually had like at one point like 200,000 evangelicals that they converted in recent American history. So they do have an impressive, I think, assimilation ability. But was that also your case or were there any issues of it being an ethnic enclave? What? Our North Campus is very convert heavy and our downtown campus is very Arab heavy. So... Um, and I, I, I see that in our churches, like Houston is a big spot and there's the, the St. George church, which has been around for, I don't know, like a hundred years or something. And wow. it's not too far from Rice University in Houston. I've, I've been to St. George once and I, I can't remember the other church I've been to. I think it's St. Joseph. That one's like all converts. And so I see this division. And that, you know, it's kind of natural, um, but I think w one of the challenges going forward as, as we enter a new era of persecution of Christians is that we are, the church is not going to survive unless we can form a new, like, ethnos unless we can become a people. And there's an extent to which these churches, and I've heard people claim that the weirdness of American orthodoxy being due to sort of an original sin of the Greeks, you know, have everyone wanting to have their own ethnic church, whatnot, but that was primarily driven by the Greeks for whatever reason. I don't... I don't know all the ins and outs of that claim. Yeah, it, it, it has to be patently false because we have the same issues and we're not in communion and we have no Greeks. <laughs> well, it, so we did the same thing. <laughs> well, I think one of the things I see, see, see in your church, and I've, I've attended one Ethiopian service uh, with you, is y all have this, you seem to have this sense of being a people. You know, in addition to your faith and we we don't have that in the the greek churches in america and i think i i, I feel that that's a failure at proper embodiment at properly forming a body and i i think that's going to be a, a a huge issue because i like what what is my culture? What is my cuisine? What food should I be cooking? How mm. should I celebrate particular occasions? Like that that's something that I should know. And I, I know I don't know that because I'm a, a white mutt raised in a materialist culture that has made every effort to try and um, disembody myself and separate myself from obligation and community. And I, I, I just don't see that. I don't see this continuing to work for very much longer because I can, I can go on Sunday, I can go on 
on feast days during the week, but you know we're not we're not embodying ourselves as a body of Christ and everything. We're in some ways we're very similar to the Protestants in that we we go to church, but what what is our culture who are we as a people and i think that that that's something that's necessary to be solved because if we're not you know if we're just a bunch of scattered people living too far away to run meal trains you know not living in close proximity not able to help each other then it's a that's not the body of christ let's say Absolutely. I think it's a great thing that especially Orthodox Jews do that they have to because of how they honor the Sabbath, which is Saturday. Um, they live close, walking distance from each other and from the synagogue. And I've said that without trying to become a cult because cults also do this. Um, I think it is very important, like you said, to being the body of Christ, doing that. And I, so I appreciate if possible, you know, within the Orthodox Church, if we had something like home parishes or at least spiritual fellowships and Callisto swear blessed memory whatever accusations of theological liberalism towards the end of his life were there i think very few people can talk about what he did for orthodoxy through his writings and through his speeches and he in assessing the the issue of the diaspora pointed to what he called a kind of jurisdictional or canonical nightmare and I've I've always advocated for that. You know, it's been a temporary thing, what we have so far. And all the Orthodox churches, you know, they need to have one North American synod. And they shouldn't have overlapping jurisdictions and bishops, you know. Um, there was a case where a couple of Eritreans, uh, and obviously that's so similar that it's almost a joke to say this because even the right is the same. But a couple of Eritreans in the Southern California Diocese of the Ethiopian Church came to an Ethiopian bishop to receive ordination. And those are the types of things that we need to do more inter-jurisdictional or diocese work and integration to create, as you said, a new sort of orthodox ethnos that is one coherent thing. It's just a matter of, I guess, you know, the selection process, which is inherently going to piss some people off because you, it's not like you do all the rights. I don't know if you're going to do like four different rights. Your guys' is easier because you all kind of stem from the Greek right. Ours inherently had two with um, Alexandria and the Syriac rite of Antioch. Uh, so Alexandria's was originally Greek, then it became Coptic and then Arabic. Syriac one was Syriac and then it went to Arabic, but it's still Syriac and Arabic. And then from there, it spawned an Armenian rite and a Giz rite. So in total, we have four, but we originally kind of had two. Um, and we just have to pick and choose between them. But I, I absolutely agree. You you mentioned Pajot as a, as a bridge to orthodoxy for you. Could you say anything more about the thought from him that you've seen, especially because you've seen him live now too, the first time you came to Southern California since we've known each other. I actually missed you. It was like right when we, I think, connected online and we, we missed each other, uh, which sucks. But you you came to visit the archpriest, Father Josiah Prenham's parish, I believe. That's where Jonathan Pajot was speaking. Could you talk about anything you took away from that, that visit? Um, so... I mean the co the context of that was. I mean the Jordan Peterson is the undercurrent for that, and there there were three streams. One was Paul Vanderclay, who is a CRC, uh, some Dutch Reformed. I forget what CRC stands for. Um, maybe Christian Reformed Church, and that that was born out of. Dutch immigrants who came to the States, Canada, and the United States. That's why one of their biggest places is in, in Michigan, right on the border there with Canada. And Vander Clay comes out of that. I don't remember whether it's his great grandfather or grandfather who first migrated to the States. And they were all dairy farmers. And the reason it was in Chino is the CRC connection is there were a lot of Dutch dairy farmers who went to 
Chino to become dairy farmers. And then the the other the next stream is uh, the John Vervecki, who is a University of Toronto cognitive scientist, I think, who has had a long-standing relationship with Peterson because they both taught at the same university. And then there's Peugeot, also the Peterson connection. I think they, I forget the story exactly, but they connected in 2015, right before Peterson's hockey stick to fame, because Peterson was on some sort of CR, uh, CBC radio program and Peugeot heard it while he was driving his car and he was dumbfounded about how some random guy understood some of the same things about symbolism uh, that he did. And they had an email exchange and Peugeot sent him uh, a talk that Peugeot did. And that's how they, they connected. And as Peugeot started doing these reaction videos to all of Pearson stuff, he got attention and he built sort of this loose community. And out of that came this estuary uh, movement, which is an attempt to give people a space to explore ideas and religion after being in this very materialistic atheist um, space for so long. And he eventually started talking to Peugeot and then they will start talking to John Verveke. And so they decided to hold this conference and the three of them came. And that's where I, I met Peugeot in person for the, uh, the first time. And it was, it was all these people from around the world who'd been in this conversation, either talking to these people or just watching what they were doing. And so that's, that's not something I'm, I'm not deeply involved in the, the estuary stuff. And I, I do honestly worry about it a little bit because I can see the need to, you know, estuary being this place where salt and fresh water mix. It's this idea that religious people and people seeking something deeper than the materialist culture they've been in, they can talk. I just worry that that, that can become a thing in of itself. And um, and I, I worry about people trying to, you know, in orthodoxy, we've got, we've got the liturgy, we've got these things we do, we've got these embodied practices, we've got prayer, and these, these things are all a whole cloth, they come together, and, and they, they were revealed to us. They're not things that we just picked and cho cho chose ourselves, but there's, you know, like with the, the meditators and the Buddhists, like like Sam Harris and whatnot, they are idiosyncratically picking a selection of different things from different cultures and attempting to build this embodied practice. And I, I feel the same way I feel about Solo Scriptura is rather than accepting received tradition and wisdom, what you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, be your own God essentially. And that that's the wrong place of focus. And so that that's one issue I have with, and I, I, I don't want to be too openly negative about public figures because I don't, you know, I, I feel that temptation, but it, that I don't know that that's productive, but I, what I see in John Verveke is this attempt to take like the hippie practice of circling and Tai Chi and cognitive science and all these different things that have developed in different places. And he's building this idiosyncratic process for himself. And he's running away from his fundamentalist upbringing. And I just don't think that any, he, he refers to traditional religions as so-called legacy religions mm. as if, as if you can build your, your own religion and that will work. And I see other people doing this. Like there's a very, a very online couple I've seen, I forget what their names are. I'll send you their, one of their videos, but they're, they're trying to build their own religion and they're trying to tell 
other people how to do this and they've got this plan like okay well like that family is trying to build their own thing and we're trying to build that own thing and we'll just have like get togethers and somehow our kids will find partners and they'll have stable lives and that just doesn't that doesn't work because you're not you're not drawing into the same higher principle you're not in the same story yeah it's um i think it's very wise of you to resist the the urge to take down i definitely had that in me it's cooled down over the years and i'm you know i wrote a whole one of my most popular articles on my sub stack is about not debating religion my hebrew teacher uh, father paul nadim tarazi who serves in in your communion the orthodox communion of originates in the greek right and he, he's from palestine from jaffa before the creation of the state of israel uh, some 80 years ago and um he has impressed upon me to to learn scripture and to teach scripture and you know to look at the liturgical rubrics things that you've mentioned and to teach those things but not to get bogged down in endless debates and endless arguments for the algorithms and for the views and with the buzzfeed like rip titles um i think a way to channel that urge is humor I think it was just today, for example, you shared something that was cracking me up. Uh, this filmmaker, <laughs> Werner Herzog, <laughs> interpreted the symbolism of the Barbie film, which I haven't seen, but it's funny that you posted it today because I was listening to somebody else's review about it while I saw you post it. I think he referred to it as a cinematic sheer hell. And, uh, you know, that's obviously funny. That's obviously humorous, whether he... Uh, means that in a sense of intentionality or unintentionality. Um, I've only ever seen his Nosferatu film. I haven't seen any of his other films, but I've listened to him talk on various subjects because I see people sharing him. Um, when I was in film class as an undergrad, I, I, did, um, I did watch Nosferatu, which is his Dracula film. And it, it really made the vampire ugly aesthetically, which I appreciated because all the things ever since that our vampires becoming ever and ever more sexy and uh, focusing on that part of the allure. And I've heard some people talking about how it's a kind of inverse to look at that symbolism, the inverse of the communion. It reminds you that every kind of deity before Christianity, including in Judaism, asks you to make burnt offerings or sacrifices to them so that they can consume it. And then you get this sacrificial Jesus who says, no, let's flip that off its head. Why don't you eat me instead? Which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Um, but yeah, I, I wonder what you think about humor in general, or if there's anything that Werner Herzog's uh, film critiques or films contribute to this conversation we're having. I, I, I like Werner Herzog. Um, I mean, I, I wanted to become... A filmmaker um not too late i mean it's, i know it's i well i i i do think it's too late personally <laughs> not 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 for me in terms of of age i think i think filmmaking has passed as a, as something that you can do um i i think it was a it was it was a particular moment in history where producing the moving image was expensive and it required um, a diverse crew of specialists. It required a lot of money and it required a, a central distribution. And so that, that necessitated that you make 90 minute, 120 minute, 180 minute films because of the economics. And if anything, uh, reels and TikToks have shown that if you can bring down the cost of video then people are more interested in short videos than they are in long videos at, at, at least to some extent maybe there's a horseshoe theory there where it's either long or it's short but i i just and the other aspect is 
the people going to San Diego to dress as stormtroopers. The the film industry and television and radio, they were effectively acting as a religion. And people want to embody stories. And so what's going to happen is, is you're going to get people buying Funko Pops and dressing up as stormtroopers and having Star Wars themed weddings and arguing over how Disney has ruined the stories they grew up on. But I, I think that, that that just reflects, I mean, why why are people bitching and moaning over the fact that their bread and circuses, the bread is not as tasty as it used to be, and the circuses <laughs> are not as entertaining as they used to be. And you know, I, I, I just find it funny and I, I have sympathy. I, I, I love the critical drinker. I, I love watching his videos where he tears apart the state of modern entertainment. But the other side of that is, is do we, do we really want to go back to a place where, you know, we're excited about the next movie and that's what's driving us? You know, I, th I think... <laughs> to to a greater or lesser extent it's it's a blessing from god that um the scales are falling away from our eyes and that the entertainment just isn't doing it for us anymore yeah here we can we have agreed too much so now we can respectfully <laughs> but vehemently disagree um i'm a very practical guy so the way in which yarvin and some other political commentators talk about what would happen to the New York Times and Harvard, which on its surf on their surface may seem to be not the state, but some people would consider them organs of the state. Um, two of the my favorite Father Josiah Trenum videos are one in which he goes in on our our wonderful governor, whom he calls Gruesome Newsome. <laughs> Just that title alone cracks me up. And uh, the more recent one, he goes in on. What he repeatedly calls the Disney Corporation. <laughs> I love, I love he adds corporation. He doesn't just say Disney, but the Disney Corporation. Mm -hmm. So one, I want you to imagine with me, and we can move on after, so that I don't want to debate you on it. But uh, imagine if uh, a new regime in America decided to give the Disney Corporation to Jonathan Pajot. What, what could he do with the skeleton of that corporation? on a smaller scale, because that's a little fantastical, I'll admit, even myself. Um, imagine, by the way, I still believe in long form, like the meta conversation is that you and I right now are already doing a long form podcast and we're into long form podcasts. So there's obviously some niche audience which is interested in long form video as a medium. Um, and I think that's true of film too, and not just video podcasts. But let's say you wanted to do what the masses are into which is obviously uh, TikTok, shout out to the CCP. We were speaking about China earlier. What if you saved up $50,000 and paid a really brilliant Zoomer or Gen Alpha person who knew the TikTok algorithms well and you were their producer? Like you posted this on Craigslist or uh, wherever the hell Upwork, <laughs> wherever this Zoomer or Alpha person would be who has the requisite skills and you are guiding them as the producer, as the mind, right? Notice I didn't say brain this time because of a conversation we had about materialism. But let's say you're the producer and you gave 50K to some Zoomer or Gen Alpha person and you told them to make very beautiful, uh, a very beautiful Orthodox Christian TikTok account, which there are some, by the way, out there. Um, just, <laughs> I'd like to get your thoughts on those hypotheticals and we can move on. Um... So let me let me completely reframe this. The embodiment. You know, the 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 idea that politics is downstream from culture. You know, so I I live in a suburb uh it used to be a farming town outside of Austin and I think 
you know, well, I, I live in a neighborhood and there's no center to it. It's just a bunch of houses and we all live here because we can afford the mortgage payments and we don't want to live in Austin. But it's not because that there's something that's drawing us together. It's not a community. And I see, I see us, you know, we like, you know, all the, the, the service I went to with you, people driving from different towns in Southern California to be there. So that that's sort of a manifestation of this community that's not actually actively in communion by living with each other. It's the same thing with my church. And we don't we don't have a, a political embodiment. We, we It's not like the town I live in is all orthodox and we're deciding, oh, that sidewalk is cracked. Let's fix that. You know, what what would that be like, you know, if we manifested ourselves not just as a body every feast day and, and every Sunday, but we, we, we manifested ourselves uh, politically and we actually knew our neighbors and we cared about them and we watched each other's kids and, w and maybe, mm. maybe not as like as strong as that, but what if we made a commitment so that, you know, at least three or four families tried to live in a neighborhood close to each other so that they could do meal trains and support each other. But we're, you know, I, so I, I see these kind of shades of embodiment and we're all the way over here. Is it really going to be useful for us to say, I don't know, take over Disney and make slightly orthodox films that are still popular? Um, I don't think so, because it's not. It's not being driven by. We're, we're, we're not embodying our culture. In, in a real sense, we're not really embodying our, our, our culture. We don't even have a culture in some sense because I see, I see cradle Orthodox people, parents in, encouraging their daughters to go to university and get a job and be independent. Um, the air women in the church deferring marriage into their 30s. Um, people often having one or two children and not in, encouraging um, their sons to go and to, to clergy and to serve the communities while at the same time, you know, they, they consume the funeral services, they get married in the church, um, but they're not making the appropriate sac sacrifice to sustain it. So I just don't see any value. I don't see any value in trying to engage in, in the American culture, if we're, we don't have the courage to actually embody ourselves across generations anymore, um, because it's just not what, what's happening is, is that that culture, that American religion is consuming us. We are feeding our children to it and it's making them into its body. And we're kind of nominally orthodox, but we're not building our own body. We're not building a body that's sufficient to fight against this atomized individualism, which the very purpose of the post-enlightenment atomized individualism idea is that it breaks down our bodies and it keeps everything flat. And so there's nothing that has the strength to compete against um, what Paul King's North calls a machine, or you can think of the body of the federal government. And that's the you know, I there is the discourse what over the 17th Amendment, the uh, popular election of the senators, it's the same, it's the same thing. This acid destroys the ability to have subsidiarity and to have bodies that can compete. And I think you know it's what a localist. Yeah. And what we need is we need you know, we've been shrunken down first to the nuclear family, so no no tribes and no clans, and then we've almost completely destroyed the nuclear family. And I think if I have kids, well, when I have kids, if I die young, like, yeah, I've got my godfather's a priest, I've got people who will step in, and I'm I'm lucky to have that. But I should be a 
a part of some sort of clan where I have obligations to it and has obligations to me. And I know clearly who's going to take over my responsibilities when I pass. And it's that it's that lack of body that results in all those people in tents on Venice Beach. Because there aren't there aren't these aren't these clans that have a responsibility to these people anymore. And that's I think that's more or less intentional. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, my Hebrew teacher again, Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, always emphasizes the 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 emphasis on tribe. And you spoke of hierarchy earlier, the patriarch within a tribe, and those networks as the social safety network. Of course, we have government programs from the machine, which have replaced these entities, and there are questions about the economic sustainability of things like that when we come from a place of Austrian economics or even like the Chicago school of Milton Friedman. Um, I'll, I'll take this as a fair critique of then the hope in one medium of art, which is film. This is the philosophy of art and science that you're on. And you mentioned your passion for photography after you, you dropped it in that low church Protestant community out of Australia have you used it at all since you've been in the orthodox church and what do you think of photography as a as a medium is it do you look at it differently than video in terms of its capacity or opportunity for the glory of god i mean i like i just need to create like the the photography and the filmmaking and the music making and the the podcasting it it's not and cooking i'm i'm a, i'm self-taught in classical french cuisine among other things it's it, it all comes from being made in the image of god and being the sort in the higher hierarchy of people that i am i embody a high degree of that creativity and I participate in God's creation in, in a way that other people don't. And this sort of brings to mind, Peugeot has talked about how, and maybe to some extent he's being polite, but he says you know, it's not that Protestants aren't Christians, it's that they don't participate as fully in Christianity as, say, the, the Orthodox do. And all people being made in the image of God, participate in creation and have the ability to create. Some people participate in that more than others do. And I'm just, um, I just have to create and it's irritating. <laughs> to you or to others? <laughs> uh, to me, <laughs> because it's, it's, it's just, it's something I have to do. It's not even, um, it's not even that I just I I have a, a. It's not that I want to take pictures. I just have to I have to make things. The muse is, is calling you. Well, a lot of our tradition in the Orthodox Church ends in the agape feast or agape meal, what we also call the coffee and tea hour. I know you're a man of refined taste in tea as well. So I'm wondering if we can close out with tea recommendations from Paul Rene Nichols. Um, tea recommendations. Green tea, black tea, oolong tea, white tea. What are you messing with? Uh, I I'd mostly drink Shung Puer. And Shung Puer comes from uh, the Yunnan Mountains in southwest China, not too far from... Uh, it's uh, on the border of Thailand and all that stuff. And there's a bunch of mountains there and they grow tea on the top. And part of that is because uh, bugs don't like high elevation. That's the main reason why it's like it's it's a protection against pests. And it's a high mountain tea is going to be guaranteed to involve pesticides less and things like that. And that it's 
it's also claimed that Yunnan is the the province in China is the original birthplace of tea, and all of the tea grown over throughout China has been the breeding selective breeding of tea as it's been brought out throughout the lands, and so. What tea is, is it's the camellia plant, camellia sinensis, and it's uh, all of the varietals that have been bred, and it's all the methods of uh, processing. Um, Pu'er, Shang Pu'er is sort of like green tea, but not really. Can you spell Shang Pu'er? Uh, we, tend to, we tend to spell it S-H-E-N-G space P-U-E-R. Or P U E R H, Sheng Pu'er. And I mean, the, the way tea breaks down is relatively simple. Green tea, certain varietals, you want to do that in spring. You cook it to shut down enzymes so it doesn't turn brown. And that's what gives you the green tea. And it's best in spring when that's fresh, it doesn't age well. Um, there's yellow tea, which is processed in a way to take some of the vegetal taste out of tea, but it looks pretty similar to green tea. There's oolong, which is doesn't even make sense of a category as a category. <laughs> Why is that? Well, I've heard of it as an in between between um, well, green and black. Like there's um, th there's there oolongs made in Taiwan that are. Uh, you break the leaves, and they they experience these enzy enzymatic reactions from the stress that create certain flavor compounds, and then you shut down the processing, and so there's no appreciable oxidation or browning of the leaf. And then there's oolongs, which are mildly to heavily oxidized, and oolongs come from all kinds of different varietals all over the different provinces in China and Taiwan. And then there's what we refer to as black tea, which the Chinese refer to as red tea. And that's the leaves are broken and allowed to oxidize, just like when you cut an apple, the same thing at browns. And that creates certain flavors. And then there's what the Chinese actually call black tea, which some tea nerds refer to as dark tea, though that's an improper translation which is composted tea where you allow the le you wet the leaves and they break down just like a compost pile and that changes the the character of the tea in a particular way in south asia southwest asia like yemen and in the horn of africa like ethiopia and somalia we like our chai which is many people have pointed to the funny linguistic phenomenon in america where you get chai tea which i always compare to the los angeles or los angeles angels which is the the angels angels or mm. chai tea tt um but it means that it's it has all these other spices that are added usually cardamom and cloves sometimes cinnamon and ginger as well do you take the tea as is or do you do you like these added spices i don't i don't know that the chinese add that as much and then there's also the equation of adding milk or milk types i mean i don't really i don't mind chai but it's not um it's not really my jam i like i like to taste the the region and the processing and the varietal um and so that also means no milk? No, I don't I don't generally do milk with tea. I I I, 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 I do tea gong fu style. Yeah. Um and gong fu is how gong fu has gotten pronounced in, in English. And I think mm -hmm. it it originally means not something to do with martial arts, but like um like studied practice or something. And so gong fu applies to all areas of life. And gong fu cha is um, the the practice of, of brewing tea. And that's like 100 milliliters of water with like 7 to 10 grams of tea. And you brew it a few seconds at a time. And you go through this progression of cup after cup. And you can also 
do that in a group setting where you're serving tea to other people. Um, but it's these these short steeps trying to experience the essence of the tea at, at its highest form. I, I see that. I've seen that actually. The ceremonies in I think Chinese and Japanese restaurants, um, maybe maybe Thai, um, but there's also this phenomenon, especially in this weird city that you're in the outskirts of, uh, that I've seen in Los Angeles as well, which is the boba phenomenon. And they oh, seem yeah. to have a lot of milk tea. So what do you make of the boba phenomena? I mean, it's, I mean, it's the Starbuck, Starbucksification of tea, you might say. I mean, I, I like it. It's, there is tea in it, but it's, it's milk and it's flavor and it's tapioca balls. Um, I think it fits our culture, which is we we want to consume things. We don't want to necessarily be involved in producing things or knowing how they're they're made. We want to be able to grab things on the go. We like things that are sweet. Yeah. Um, so it it just kind of fits into our culture. It's the same thing as like Starbucks. I remember I was I was with my my dad's older brother in boston some some winter when my grandmother was still alive and we were in harvard square and he took me to starbucks and i got a cappuccino and at that time starbucks didn't have all these drinks and you, you go today and it's like however many pumps of sugar syrup and the whipped cream and all that stuff and that's how a lot of people see um coffee these days yeah it's very deceptive at one point in the pandemic I had gained something like 40 pounds, which actually happens to be the average uh, millennial weight gain during the pandemic. And one of the things I noticed, I was drinking these quote unquote chai tea lattes from Starbucks and they had like 30 plus grams of sugar in them. And I had no idea because in my head, it was just a tea bag plus whatever milk type that you want, which would have maxed out at like 12 to 15 grams of sugar. But without knowing it, they had these pre-made powders in which they added so many things and they have syrups too that they add. And so I have um, come to appreciate more black coffee like drip, which is what my father has always drank without any additives or what the American soldiers, uh, which kind of parallels uh, your family history, but rather than in Germany and Italy, uh, apparently drank, which is where the Americano comes from, just like a hot espresso with uh, hot water. And um, there's some, I take iced, uh, iced Americanos too. And there's something beautiful to like that simplicity or the macchiato, which is a lot less sugar unless you get the caramel macchiato. Um, as we close out, could you plug anywhere you want people to find you online and or any closing remarks or word, word to the wise, any advice for any seekers out there if they're on the fence? Um. Well, you can follow my antics on Twitter, uh, Paul Renee Nichols. Um, if if that's at all edifying, <laughs> I don't know. Um, where One hopes. Lies. Um, know what time it is. Um, we can see things breaking down and we're flailing around worrying about there being no more blockbuster movies and things getting more expensive and not being able to maintain our pseudo independent lives, living in apartments by ourselves, eating DoorDash and watching Netflix. Um, Things are, things are just going to get that much worse. This year is going to be. This year is just going to be terrible. Like if you remember twenty twenty, this is twenty twenty part two. But everything is getting turned up to eleven. Um, you you need people. You you may not think you you do you need people because. You know, you've got a job and you've got your cat at home or whatever, and the police are taking care of everything. But we used to depend on people, you know, 
women dependent on their fathers and their brothers and their husbands to take care of them. Now they think the police are going to rescue them. And we can see all that breaking down. It's time to go to church and get into community. And this is only going to accelerate. And so it's just time to take a look in the mirror and stop fooling yourself that any of this materialist individualism is working. Thank you so much.